100 years ago today, on the 31st of May 1916, the largest naval battle in world history took place. The British Grand Fleet, part of the largest navy in the world, engaged the German High Seas Fleet off the coast of Denmark in the Battle of Jutland. The German navy at that time was the second largest in the world, and its expansion had led to great consternation in Britain in the years before the Great War, where it had been seen as a direct threat to British dominion of the waves. For the Germans, a large fleet was a prestige symbol, but for Britain it was an issue of national survival. The naval build-up in the early 20th century had seen great advances in shipbuilding, including the creation of the all-big-gun capital ship, the Dreadnought, and the lightly armoured but heavily armed battle cruiser. This technology, whilst revolutionary, had never been tested, and there were few with an accurate idea of how these new ships would perform in battle. The revolutionary development of submarines and aircraft had likewise altered war at sea in ways that no one had anticipated, and people were still trying to come to terms with in 1916. The war, up until this point, had seen numerous naval skirmishes, such as the battles of the Falkland Islands or Dogger Bank, but little in the way of decisive action, as the British followed their favoured tactic of blockading the continent. German naval commanders had been nervous about the prospect of risking their prized ships against the combined might of Britain and France, and had largely limited action to commerce raiding and attacks on isolated coaling stations. By 1916, these raiding ships, such as the wildly successful SMS Emden, had been effectively neutralised, and British and Allied forces had overrun most of the German colonial empire. U-boat raiding had had a far greater effect on the Allied war effort, whilst lightning naval raids on undefended British coastal towns had damaged the reputation of the Royal Navy and forced the home fleet to disperse to protect the entire east coast of Britain. But the German government, aware of how the British blockade was already hurting their people, were hankering to get a return from the huge investment made in their surface shipping, and it turned the tables of the war as a whole. When the aggressive Reinhard Scheer assumed command of their navy, it appeared they would have that chance. Scheer believed that he could provoke elements of the Royal Navy into action and eliminate the British piecemeal by isolating and overwhelming sections of their dispersed fleet. The initial German plan was to draw the British ships out to be attacked by submarines and zeppelins, but a combination of bad weather and the poor endurance of early submarines led this plan to be scrapped in favour of surface fleet action. The alternative plan was to attack British merchant shipping near the Skagerrak, the confined coastal waters of Denmark, in the hopes of drawing out parts of the British fleet to be destroyed by waiting dreadnoughts. Unfortunately for the Germans, the British had already cracked their radio encryptions and were well aware of the build-up for this plan. Whilst they were unaware of the details, it was known that the German fleet would be sailing on the 31st of May, and Admiral Sir John Jellicoe resolved to deploy the entire Grand Fleet to the mouth of the Skagerrak to deny the Germans the means to move out into the North Sea. Jellicoe personally led 16 dreadnoughts and three battle cruisers from Scarpa Flow on the night of May the 30th, and was joined by a further eight dreadnoughts soon after. These ships were already underway before the German forces had even slipped their moorings. Sixteen German dreadnoughts and eight pre-dreadnought battleships were forming up at the Heligoland in the early morning light of the 31st. The British contingent was to be joined by Admiral Beatty, who commanded six battle cruisers and four fast battleships. These forces intended to rendezvous 90 miles west of Skagerrak to await the German arrival. Including light cruisers and destroyers, the British were to deploy 151 ships against 99 German. German submarines spotted several elements of the British battlecruiser fleet as they moved out from the 4th, but were unable to plot their bearing. They also missed the bulk of Jellicoe's force. These observations gave Scheer the mistaken impression that the British were doing exactly as he had hoped, deploying their forces in small sections. Yet whilst this should have given Jellicoe a major advantage, he received an erroneous report from Admiralty headquarters that the main German fleet had not deployed at all. A potentially fatal error. At 9am the German battlecruiser squadrons cleared the mouth of the Skagerrak, followed by their dreadnought forces. By 11.30 the weather had cleared sufficiently for zeppelins to deploy as scouts for the force, although the notorious North Sea weather limited visibility for all involved. As the forces approached one another, each no longer aware that the other was present, cruisers from both fleets spotted a civilian trawler and moved to intercept it. 
At half past two, British scout cruisers engaged a picket of German destroyers, marking the beginning of the battle. Both elements called for reinforcements as the Germans retreated. The unproven battle cruisers were the first ships to respond, with Beatty bringing in his six capital ships. His impetuosity had seen him leave behind his state of the art super dreadnoughts. Opposing Beatty was Admiral Hipper. German fire proved initially far more accurate than the British, who inexplicably failed to take advantage of their greater range. Beatty's flagship, the HMS Lion, was struck in the turret and burst into flames. When two minutes later HMS Indefatigable was struck in the magazine and exploded in a catastrophic pillar of smoke and flame. Twenty minutes later HMS Queen Mary was likewise totally destroyed. Each of these ships took over a thousand men down with them. Beatty quickly surmised the situation. There's something wrong with our bloody ships today. The German battlecruisers, by contrast, had not suffered from the same sacrifice in armour during their design. Yet despite their advantage, the Germans were withdrawing, and Beatty pursued in the run to the south. Beatty was hoping for immediate support, but communications were still largely being sent by flag, which were totally inefficient with the smoke, range and carnage of the new form of combat. Beatty was only saved from falling straight into the German trap by the light cruiser HMS Southampton, who, whilst ranging ahead, spotted the main German fleet and radioed both Beatty and Jellicoe to warn them. Beatty promptly swung around and retreated, drawing the Germans in turn after him in the run to the north that would lead them into the teeth of the British Grand Fleet, which Jellicoe was in the process of deploying for battle. Beatty once again neglected to properly communicate with his dreadnought support, leaving his four unfortunate battleships to turn under their own initiative and handle the fire of the entire pursuing high seas fleet. Nonetheless, these properly armoured ships withstood the barrage and withdrew in good order. When the Germans emerged from the mist, they initially sighted the armoured cruiser HMS Defence, which had ranged too far ahead from Jellicoe's main force, and obliterated it. But the Germans were soon shocked to find themselves facing an enormously superior force waiting for them, seeing the entire horizon erupt in flame as the British dreadnoughts found their targets. Jellicoe had formed his fleet into a textbook formation named Crossing the T, presenting the guns of the entire British fleet to the Germans, an extremely difficult feat given that he had no previous indication of what directions the enemy would be approaching from. Minutes after battle had joined, after another British battlecruiser exploded spectacularly, Shear turned and withdrew. Jellicoe kept his distance, aware of the torpedo threat to his ship. Jellicoe was able to cross their T again, pouring fire onto the German dreadnoughts and severely damaging several for minimal return damage. Again, Scheer ordered his fleet to withdraw, ordering his light units to essentially sacrifice themselves to delay the British as he fell back into the mist. Hipper led his battlecruisers into the teeth of the British fire to deter a pursuit of the main fleet, and whilst he lost no ships, every one of his charges was badly damaged. Under cover of a smokescreen, Hipper withdrew, leaving his torpedo boats to further harass the British. As night fell, the entire German force withdrew. Jellicoe decided not to pursue them, preferring not to risk any more ships or lives, and a humble German fleet was able to limp back to friendly ports. The entire battle had lasted a little over six hours, and would be the last major fleet clash of the entire war. Tens of thousands of sailors served at Jutland, including the future King George VI and eight future First Sea Lords. Four Victoria Crosses were earned, whilst both German commanders gained the Prussian Paul Le Merit order. The battle claimed 8,648 lives on 25 sunk ships, and bodies were to be washed up on the Swedish coast for days to come. The catastrophic destruction of three British battlecruisers fundamentally undermined the concept of the ship. Whilst poor shell handling had made them unsafe, it was apparent that their speed was no substitute for armour. The battle was a wake-up call for a generation raised on the invincibility of the Royal Navy. The people of Britain clamoured for a decisive naval clash in the form of Trafalgar, yet found this enormous battle seemingly without a clear winner. But whilst a more aggressive commander might have been able to obliterate the German fleet entirely, Jellicoe more than achieved his primary goal of keeping the Germans contained. He was well aware of the untested nature of many of his forces, and his ultimate responsibility for the security of the nation weighed heavily on his mind. Jellicoe was calculated in his caution, and was willing to compromise on tactical supremacy for the sake of the strategic goal. The German high seas fleet would not venture from port again until its surrender to the British in 1919. 
So whilst the Royal Navy failed to knock out the German threat entirely, they nonetheless achieved a clear victory. The blockade was maintained and compounded its effect on the Central Powers, and Allied manpower could be safely ferried to the continent, allowing for the land war to be effectively fought. The German effort was bold, but as one contemporary writer observed, the prisoner had assaulted his jailer, but remained firmly behind bars.